Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Greg Kowser. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, you've given us a Sunday morning, uh, but more importantly, I hope you've, uh, you're giving God your Sunday morning. And it just so happens that you're doing it here uh, at Emmanuel. Uh, and so we're so glad to have you here this morning. It's a special day at the beginning of every month. Uh, we do celebrate the communion, uh, that which Christ ordained or commanded for his church to do is a constant reminder of who he is, what he has done, uh, his death on the cross, and as we sang here, his resurrection from the dead. And it's also to remind us of who we are, uh, that we're people who have been rescued and redeemed. We're people who were hopeless and bankrupt and completely unable to do anything about the darkest things that threatened us and the darkness that ruled us. And Christ has delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and put us in the kingdom of light. Uh, and he's put his favor on us forever. Uh, just the imagery of the grace of God, his loving favor washing over us uh, over and over uh, in the midst of everyday life uh, is such an encouraging reminder of the ongoing care and love of Christ. And so we're here too to, be recall, to recall who we are, what it means to be followers of Jesus, and that not only individually, uh, but also what it means to be a group of people who follow Jesus together. Uh, what does it look like when you see a group of men and women who come together that have only one thing in common? They have uh, their common commitment to Jesus as the one who delivers them and to the one that they fully serve and give their lives to. And that unites us across ethnic boundaries, that unites us across the educational boundaries and socioeconomic boundaries, ethnic boundaries. Uh, those are all obliterated because we are in Christ. And so we want to harness everything that we bring from our own backgrounds to serve Christ and to adorn what it means to be the people of God. But we also want to submit everything that we bring from our backgrounds to Christ so that it doesn't stand in the way of our union in Christ. So, so glad that you're here, uh, so excited about the topic that we have to talk about today. As we come for a remembrance today, I just want to say and preface, uh, we'll move right into the communion uh, right when I'm finished with our meditation this morning. Uh, and our communion is open uh, to all who profess Christ as Savior. He calls it, we call it the Lord's table because it's the table that he put in place. Uh, he invites those who trust in him to come and be reminded of his loving care and blessing uh, and of their identity. If you don't know Christ today, I would encourage you not to take the communion today, but I would pray that this would be the day that you would come to know the Christ who invites you to this table for your blessing as we come. All right, if you have your Bibles, would you open to the book of Romans? The book of Romans, uh, it, it, when you open your Bible to the book of Romans, if you have uh, a written text today, it'll look like you're about... Uh, um, eight-tenths of the way through your whole Bible, even though it's a, a, a big uh, letter in and of itself, but I want to encourage you to, to move through there. Uh, looks like we've got, uh, oh, there we are. Okay, thank you, Drew. We are in a series uh, in the book of Romans. Uh, people who've been around the church for any length of time uh, know that the book of Romans is one of the easiest, shortest, less dense books you could read in the Bible. Uh, all those statements are not true. Uh, it, is, it is a hefty book. Uh, it is rich with theology. Uh, and one of the reasons why sometimes people do not read it, even believers, is because it'll, it'll push you a little bit to pay attention to what Paul's trying to do. And uh, as with anyone who loves you, uh, Paul is going to speak the truth to you, and there are some hard words in the book of Romans uh, that we all need to hear for our blessing. Paul is a spiritual surgeon who inflicts pain in order to heal. And so we need to listen to him. We're going to be working through the book of Romans over the course of this whole year, uh, up until the middle, beginning of the next summer. And so we, we do have notebooks that we're inviting people to pick up and engage with us to, for you to study ahead of time. Um, uh, you will be studying for next week. You'll be studying chapter 1, verse 18 through the end of the chapter. I believe that's verse 32. But you'll be studying that through uh, this next week in preparation for our sermon coming up for the week to come. Now our series, we're also at the same time, we're memorizing some verses together. And I want you to read this with me if you would. Hopefully you're uh, maybe around your kitchen table, maybe in your uh, family discussions, uh, maybe you personally, uh, maybe you've got this pinned on your uh, bathroom mirror. 
or hopefully it's if it's up in your visor or something there that you don't have it pinned so that you can't drive safely. Uh, but whatever it is that you have, maybe you have a little app uh, that helps you to memorize things. There's a number of good resources to do that. But this is a key verse that really states the theme of the whole letter, and we talked about this just last week. So would you read it with me? Uh, would you just mind standing with me and reading it, please, together? And let's read this together. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Thank you. You may be seated. Now today, within that bigger story, we're going to pull apart one little phrase, uh, the phrase that occurs in Romans chapter 1, it occurs in Romans chapter 15 and chapter 16, and we're going to hear this is a phrase that's unique to all of Paul's letters that causes a lot of people who read Paul carefully to wonder why he describes uh, his mission to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles, of course, from the biblical perspective, is everyone who's not a Jew. So that includes all the other races and ethnic groups and tribes that make up uh, humanity. But Paul talks about the fact that he had been appointed by God, by direct divine action, and we'll talk about that, to be an apostle, one commissioned by God to bring the good news about who Jesus is, about what he did, and what, it will, what will happen to you if you believe and trust in his work on the cross, in his person as the Son of God, that you will be brought into the blessings, what's called the new covenant blessings, that were given to the Jews. And so Paul's a Jew who's been called to go to the Gentiles to say that God has opened a way through Jesus for you to come into all the blessings that the Jews know. This is why there's a little, there's a little chorus in, in uh, if you grow up in the Christian world, uh, at least that I grew up in, it went something like this. Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. And we know that, right? And then you do the arm thing and everything, but I'm not going to do that for you today. Uh, but you do all those things, but it has to do with the idea that Abraham, we think of Father Abraham, well, he's not uh, my, uh, in my lineage. I don't have any Jewish blood as far as I know, but my spiritual lineage is straight, straight back to Abraham. Father Abraham. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today. So we're going to talk about that phrase, the obedient of faith. You can see it in Romans 1, 5, 15, 18, and 16, 19. So this is an unusual little phrase, and I want to unpack it. I'm also responding to, where's Jared Holloway? Jared Holloway was sitting in here after I spoke. Yeah, there he is right over there. After I spoke on 1, 1 to 7, he was unsatisfied with my treatment of that little phrase. So I'm going to deal with it, right? Just as, This is a sermon to Jared for Jared today. All right. Now, <clears throat> so as we come at this issue, uh, we are coming to the time where we're going to remember. And one of the key things that happens at communion, it's, and we know this phrase, do this in remembrance of me, okay? Do this in remembrance. The, the key thing that I want you to remember here about when the Bible talks about remembering, the Bible means to take an event that God has accomplished, a word that God has said, and take that word, that event, and bring it in relationship to the present in order to affect change in the present. It's not nostalgia, it's not just to reflect over some good memory that you had, but it's to bring the event that God, what God did, what he said, and you remember it in such a way that it stills your fears. It restrains you from sin. It, it moves you out in praise. It gives you confidence to trust God that he'll keep his promises. Right? And so the act of remembrance is where every, uh, on a regular basis, the people of God were commanded by Jesus, Right? So Jesus accomplished his work. He demonstrated that he was the king that was going to solve the world's ultimate problems. And he was the king. And so he came and he made provision for us to come under his rule and out from under the rule of the evil one and our own evil desires. So he went up onto the cross to take the punishment that we deserved. 
He provided a way for us to have a relationship with the God that we had spurned. And then he raised from the dead and gave us new life. And now he's commissioned those of us who believe in him to go and proclaim that Jesus is the king and the king invites you to come under his rule, but the king is coming. And so one of the important disciplines or the important practices of the people of God is as we walk through a world where the church is an outpost of the kingdom to come, right? Christ's full kingdom rule is waiting yet to happen. So right now, there's still a lot of evil things going on. Right now, you struggle with sin in your own heart, let alone with the difficulties that are happening around us. We still live in a world that's cursed because of the fall. Hence, we just had Hurricane Ian. We had COVID. We still live in a broken world, right? Creation, Paul would say in Romans, is groaning and waiting for God to fully right everything. Well, how do we keep our mind? How do we keep hold of what's true? How do we keep our identity clear? How do we keep our mission clear? Right? How do we keep remembering about what kind of people we are? Well, Jesus said you need to keep coming back and you need to use these elements to remind you of who I am, of what I'm up to, of who you are, of what I've made you, of the resources I've given you, and even the event itself of sitting down and having fellowship with God at the table is depicting the fact that we're welcomed, and it's a picture in advance of the fact that one day we'll sit around the table in heaven in the great marriage supper of the Lamb and enjoy fellowship with God forever, right? So it reminds us of the past, of the present, of the future, so we need to come, and it, it's meant to change the way we behave today. So there's three things that I want to get after when it comes to this little phrase, the obedience of faith, there's going to be three mo- reminders about God that we need to keep in mind, right? And, I, and, and again, if any of you are consumers of the news or if you're one of the non-consumers that you just can't take it anymore so you don't watch the news anymore and you spend your life whiling away on TikTok, right, or watching reels of cats, or people talking to their dogs, or something like that. So you've kind of disconnected from life, but some of that that disconnection isn't so much that you've run to TikTok because uh, that's what you want to pursue in your life. You might do it to escape from life, right? And so, and even indirectly, your escape into the world of social media is about you trying to deal with the pressures and difficulties of life. And as you all know, we live in a moment of unprecedented levels of anxiety, of depression, of alarming rates of suicide, absolutely alarming rates of suicide. And we live in a moment that's just full of of difficulties and strife. We live in a moment in my own life, right now that I'm 60, I can say these things as an old man, uh, in my life that I've never seen the United States as polarized as it is. And I don't mean just politically polarized. I mean that the people on both sides of the aisle are demonized as evil. That's different. So we live in a moment that has all kinds of stresses and strains. We in America, right, people from the rest of the two-thirds of the world uh, who've lived out their Christian life in outright persecution and complete uh, material uh, deprivation, have had nothing, right, basically. Uh, Even the poorest person in the United States is incalculably rich compared to the vast majority of people in the world. And now we're... uh, 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 experiencing some very unsettling things where uh, it's no longer respectable to view um, relationships between men and women from what we would call a biblical perspective. Marriage is on the decline. Marriage itself is not honored. Uh, The family itself is redefined and recalibrated. Even what it means to be a man or a woman is in question. And many of us find ourselves really unsettled. And in those moments, right, we can become the henny penny, right? We can run around and say, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, Uh, right? We can put our head in the sand. Uh, We can try to distract ourselves or wrap ourselves up in all kinds of different things to try to deal with the pressure. And some people are doing it well and some people are not. So what do we need to be reminded about to hold on to our identity, to hold on to the presence of God, to hold on to our mission in the midst of a moment that's full of all kinds of crises, right? Now, here's how Paul begins his letter. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures. 
So this good news, the gospel, this good news is really something that's been anticipated because it's been promised. It's been promised beforehand. And, but the promise in the Holy Scriptures in our Old Testaments regards his son. Okay, Jesus is who's being referred to, but he uses son because it not only ties Jesus to God in terms of his deity, he's uniquely the son of God, but it also ties him to the line of kings because uh, frequently, and you want to read this if you read in the book of Psalms, often the king of Israel is referred to as my son. Read about it in Psalm 2 or Psalm 110. If you want to read those, my son. So it's not just that it's speaking to Jesus' deity. It's also speaking to the fact that he's a king figure. And we want to, he makes that clear by then saying, as to his earthly life, was a descendant of David, right? He's from the Davidic line. David is the king, and we're going to read the passage today, that God promised that ultimately it was one of your heirs, who is going to sit on the throne and be ruler forever over all nations. So we need to know if Jesus truly is the coming king, the promised one, he had to be from the line of David. And then it goes on, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection of the dead. So Jesus was demonstrated to be the son of God in his deity by virtue of the fact that he came out of the grave, just as we were singing. Right? By the power of the Spirit of God, he came out of the grave and demonstrated that he was indeed the Son of God. So he has the earthly credentials and the heavenly credentials to be the coming king. Because the king that we need to bring peace, the Old Testament word is shalom, the New Testament word erene, the one that we need to bring a peace that's actually going to deal with the natural evil, Right? The fact that the world has diseases and hurricanes and famine and starvation. Right? We need someone to deal on that level, but we also need someone who can actually renovate people from the inside out. We need somebody who can holistically change us. This has to be some special kind of king. David was a great king, but he couldn't do that. David couldn't save himself. Solomon was super wise, and then he became a total idiot. Right? Pretty disappointed if that was the king. And now here we have, we've got a king that we need who's going to bring and right things. So the Son of God, through him, right now here he's talking about through Jesus, we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles, right? Now here Paul's speaking of himself as a Jew, to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Now, here's what we mentioned before. Paul says, here's my mission. Here's the mission that I was given, to proclaim God's good news about his son to all Gentiles. Right? So, Paul is going to talk much about his mission because his mission, as we look at it, is a statement that God wants this good news to go. His very life and calling is all about God extending the blessings to, uh, from Abraham to the Gentiles. So Gentiles, so that they might come under his benevolent rule and uh, his uh, loyal subjects to the glory of their king. Now what I'm talking about here is Faith working out in obedience. Okay, we'll talk about those. So the idea here to come under his benevolent rule, by faith for Paul, faith is always a, an element of understanding what Christ claims for himself, if you believe in him. Right? It's not a formula, a magic formula. There was at one time, I mentioned this in one of my classes the other day, um, there's a scary passage in Mark about blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Every other kind of sin will be forgiven except if you blaspheme the Spirit. Well, there's a website that started where a person said, I invite you to come out onto this website and blaspheme the Spirit, and I guarantee you nothing will happen to you. Okay? So it was a whole bunch of little video clips of mostly young people saying, I blaspheme the Spirit. Right? You could tell right at the moment that 99% of them didn't even know what they were talking about because they couldn't define blasphemy if they had to, number one. Number two, they treat words as if they're magic spells, right? As if you could say, blaspheme the Spirit, and something happened, right? That's not what he means by blaspheme the Spirit, any more than for a Christian is someone who's confessed that Jesus is Lord. That's not, Jesus is Lord, I guess I'm a Christian, 
right? I, I sent a spell out there and now I'm a Christian. No, no, to confess Jesus as Lord is to say, I recognize that, that I'm a sinner. I, I recognize that I can't save myself. I recognize that he's the one who died for me to take what I deserve. I recognize that he is God of very God. And I bow my knee to him as my master and my savior. That's what it means to confess Jesus as Lord, right? So the issue here is, is when the obedience of faith is obedience is the natural outworking of a faith that is rightly placed in Jesus, a faith that believes in him for who he is. And faith for Paul is never something you do that earns God's favor. It's always put over against works. Faith is never a work. So one of the ways I like to describe it to myself, and it goes right into the, uh, the uh, song that we were singing earlier. I said, that's going to be good for my description of faith, right? Is where the idea, it's abandoning yourself. It's surrender, right? Faith is, I can't save myself. Faith is, I'm lost and bankrupt. Faith is, I'm hopeless. God, be merciful to me as a sinner. God, please, in your mercy, do for me what I cannot do for myself, right? So faith in and of itself stands over against work. But what Paul wants to say is, is that faith that's placed in Christ unleashes this power. And one of the verses we're going to know, you've been gifted with this new life, that it's set in motion a change in you. It's created a different person that's going to work its way out in different attitudes, different passions, different priorities, a different vision of life. Things that you love are going to be different. It's going to set you over against the world in which you live in many, many different ways. So you come under his benevolent rule as his loyal subjects. So one of the characteristics of those who are followers of Jesus is that they will stay followers of Jesus. That doesn't mean that Christians don't sin. It doesn't mean that Christians can really get messed up. They can get addicted to things. They can get caught up in stuff. And sometimes we as believers are called, and read about this in Galatians 6, if I see a brother or sister who's lost their mind and got caught up in a sin, then I need to go after them to recoup them. Right? I need to go after them. So the assumption is just because you're a believer doesn't mean you'll always do things right. You're still on the way one day, right, today, if you follow Jesus, you'll get to experience being good as a follower of Christ because you'll lean in on his power, you'll make wise decisions, you'll head in that direction. But even in your best day, there are broken pieces laying on the ground. Even in your best day, there's things to confess. Even in your best day, there's regrets that you need the grace of God to get over. Even in your best day, one day, you'll just be good. One day, right? Right? And any of us that are honest with ourselves about the life that we live, I'm yearning for the day when I'll just be good. It gets sweeter the older I get, right? Now, so here's two more passages where he used that same phrase. For I will not venture, chapter 15, to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience, right? So this is the language to bring them underneath the rule of King Jesus, Okay. And notice, notice how the obedience by word and deed is that Paul sees that his life as follower of Jesus involves what he says as well as what he does. Right? There's no such thing as a Christian in Paul's mind or the New Testament altogether who professes things about Jesus and then there's no life change. Those just don't go together. That's why Paul will often discourage people from paying attention to anybody who operates this way, right? Don't do what I do, but do what I say. Paul says, no. If there's somebody who professes to be a follower of Jesus and they're trying to get you to do what they're not doing, don't follow them. So the issue here is Paul's going to call them, but this is his job. This is what his mission is, okay? Now here, there's first of our reminders, three things. I want to draw some things here. It reminds us of God's sovereignty. You're going to say, how does the obedience of faith remind us of God's sovereignty, right? Paul's mission means that God is accomplishing his creation-wide plan, okay? So Paul uses this phrase because he wants to make sure that we connect what he's doing with the Gentiles to the whole biblical storyline, right? 
So it becomes a, a, a little a phrase that he uses that makes us, if we're Bible readers, think up and say, why is he saying the obedience of faith? Because Paul doesn't usually speak that way. But here in this one, he's given us a cue, right? He's given us a cue to think, wait a minute, maybe something unique he's referring here. Here he's talking about the normal uh, of people coming to Christ and what it looks like, but he's using a phrase that ties into the biblical storyline so that we can see that what's happening with the Gentiles is the outworking of God's plan that's been set in motion for generations. For generations, okay? And so the phrase itself makes us think God is sovereign, right? He's sovereign. He's working out his plan, right? This is one of the things that Paul's going to celebrate so often in the book of Romans, one of my favorite passages in the book of Romans that I return to frequently to remind myself of of who I am and how I should think about life is that doxology that prays at the end of chapter 11, especially when life is just out of control, and where I think I know better than God, and I'm, I, I'm trying to give him some advice because my life isn't going the way I, I want it to. And Paul steps in there and he goes, well, well, God, who's ever been your counselor? Who's ever been your counselor to give you any advice? Who's ever put you in, your, in their debt so that you owe them something? Well, no one, right? God, your ways are inscrutable and past finding out. And then he ends with this little praise. He says, for from you... Everything that exists, you made it. Through you, everything that continues to exist, it's because you sustain it. And to you, everything is moving toward the goal for which you've made it. To God be the glory. Right? I need to hear that. Right? So his sovereignty. And now here, let's go back. What is he referring to? Here we are in Genesis chapter 12. There's Genesis 12, 15, and 17, if you wanted to read uh, more information here. But this is where uh, God comes to Abraham and makes a covenant with Abraham, an arrangement right, of grace where he invites uh, Abraham into this uh, set of arrangements of obligations. And, and the arrangement is for Abraham to abandon himself and believe the promise. And when he believes the promise, this is reckoned to him. This is considered by God for him for righteousness. And he's brought into a right relationship with God. He's restored. But he's believing on a promise that he will never in his lifetime see fulfilled. Okay? We get to see the fulfillment of the promise, but it's this promise. He said, I will make you into, Abraham, a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So as we read through the Old Testament, they're constantly reflecting on, well, how is it that all the Gentiles, all the peoples on earth, right, all the non-Jews, how will they be blessed through the Jews? How will that happen? Is the idea. Now we move forward a little bit. Genesis 49, a little bit later, we get a little bit more clarity about how this blessing is going to come about. Right? So what we need, right? the biblical story starts off with this garden, with this intimate relationship with God, this union that we have with him, this flourishing of humans and humanity, even in relationship to each other, not only individually, but in relationship with each other. And then what happens? Well, Adam and Eve think that they know better. They get convinced that God isn't out for their best. They begin to doubt his word. They get puffed up with their own pride and decide, I think I know better, and and break that relationship with the holy God and sever that. But God in his mercy doesn't destroy them, but he puts them out of the garden. And then the whole question as we read the the rest of the Bible is, will Adam and Eve ever get back in the garden? Will that relationship ever get restored? And how can it be restored? Because it becomes pretty clear is that God has to restore it because humanity can't fix what they've broken. And not only can humanity get back in a relationship with them, well, what about the world? Because the world is broken. There's pain. There's suffering. There's difficulty. Right? Who can write all of that? Okay. So we need a God intervention. So Abraham is told... Through you, Abraham, through your seed, I'm going to bring about the person who's going to bring blessing back to the earth. Okay? Then we find out in Genesis 49 that it's going to be a ruler who's going to come out of the line of Judah. Now, Judah was one of the sons of Jacob, right? A descendant from Abraham. And he says, the scepter 
will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. The obedience of faith. We're waiting for, in the Old Testament, this heir who's going to come to bring back the nations underneath his rule. Well, who is that? Right, as we're reading the story. Then we move a little bit further, further here in 2 Samuel chapter 7. This is the covenant, the agreement that God made with David, King David, that signaled him out as a unique heir, unique kingly line within Israel. And he says, but my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Right? So he's given a promise to David that eventually his uh, kingdom, his heirs will rule forever. When you're reading the Old Testament, that's one of the questions like, well, uh, does it look too good by the time you get to the end of the Old Testament? The land is overrun by foreigners. There is no heir of David on the throne. There is no peace. There is no flourishing. Uh, and matter of fact, they've abandoned their relationship with God. Well, wh who's the king who's going to come and bring back peace? Not just the absence of warfare, but it's going to bring back a right relationship with God, a right relationship between the Jews and enable the Jews to actually be a blessing to the nations. Who's going to do that? It's going to be a Davidic king, God tells David. Well, then, this is a famous, we're not too long, we'll be in the Christmas season, right? And one of our famous ones is Isaiah chapter 9, and Isaiah is looking forward. And I just want you to notice the things that we don't often think about when we're saying Isaiah 9. We love to think about the baby in the manger. We don't think about him as the prince, the coming governor of the world, right? So this is why when Anna and Simeon, right, if you're reading Luke and they come to the temple, they've been told by God that that child, God has often uh, started a new phase in his work through a child who's going to be the answer to the problems that are there. And so they're waiting, Anna and Simeon, you can read about it in Luke chapter 1, they're waiting for the child of all children to be born. And when Simeon sees this baby, he says, this, this is the promised salvation of God. When Anna says, this is the promised comfort that God was going to bring to his people. So here's what it says. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, right? The Davidic son, a king, and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Right? So the king is coming, and he's going to come first as a child. So we get an idea that this is going to be an unconventional king. We're prepped for that. We don't expect kings to show up as vulnerable children. But this king's going to show up, and he's going to be a king that's going to begin his life in humility. He's also going to be a king that's actually going to have to die for his subjects to allow them to come under his rule. And then, lastly here, in Isaiah chapter 11, this is actually the verse that he quotes, in, uh, Paul quotes in, in uh, Romans chapter 15. But it says, in that day... And here we're talking about the day that God has planned. The root of Jesse, right, speaking of an offspring from the line of Jesse, which is the dad of David. It's David's dad, David the king. In the day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. So when we come to read the obedience of faith among the nations, among the Gentiles, Paul's given us a clue that I'm talking about bringing to fruition the plan of God that has been in motion, right, for the ages. So this proclamation of mine, this commission that I have, is fulfilling God's promises. And as I put here with that little sign that you see uh, Britain made famous, right, in terms of that, keep calm. And remember that God is in control. I mean, seriously, you, 
We've gone through some difficult moments. We've had some people that have died recently. I feel like we have been a little bit in this little season of death. Keep calm. Cry. Don't despair. Because that's not the final word. For everyone who knows Jesus, that's not the final word. We miss them, we yearn for them because we're not made for partings. Every funeral is a reminder of the fall and of the curse. But thank God, a cross and an empty tomb stands over that coffin. Right? So keep calm. God's in control. My wife is uh, famous in my mind. She's famous because we pray together in the mornings. And one of her regular things, uh, she, I think this would be fair to say, and this is not harming her in any way, I think she'll say this. My, my wife struggles with wanting to be in control of everything. I know that none of you struggle with that, right? She likes to have things scheduled and under control. It's just sad that life doesn't cooperate so often, uh, especially her husband. He gets out of control. But the, the kind of things you like to have things in control, but life just gets blown up all the time, Right? And when that happens, you get reminded that ultimately, and this is, this is the shaking thing, ultimately every one of us, we don't have control over the things that matter to us most. Do you have control that you're going to live the rest of this day? No. By God's grace, most of us, if we know the stats, will. But we have no control. I don't care if you're 20. I don't care if you're 30. I don't care if you're 80. You don't have any more of the guarantee of today. Do, do we have, for every one of us that are parents, one of the things that we would love to have complete control over is the state of our kid's heart. Oh, I so long for them to love Jesus. I so want them to follow Jesus, but I can't make that happen. For everyone who has a friend who's, who's drifted away from Jesus or who's digging a hole right now and you so want them to put the shovel down, you wish you could put the shovel down. You wish you could find some switch on their soul that you could turn off and say, you know, boom, the power would go down and they put the shovel down instead of keep digging the hole that they're in. But you can't make that happen. You can pray for them. You can commend it to them. You can warn them. And sometimes you just have to sit silently by when they say, shut up, I don't want to hear from you anymore. Right? If somebody's in control, and the reason why, right, I can deal with the moments that I don't know why is because I know the one who does know why. I know who knows why, and I know it's not spinning out of control. I know things are just not randomly going where they want. I know I don't have to try to fix everything. As a matter of fact, when I do, I will be destroyed in the face of it, and I will destroy other people trying to control everything. You know, one of the most frustrating things that you know as a parent when your anxiety gets up and you think you are in control, then often you become this badgering uh, person who drives the person away from the very goal you want them to get to. So I need the strength from God just to shut my mouth sometimes. Okay, I've said enough. Right? So God's in control. Now, second thing, a reminder, right, of God's faithfulness. Paul's mission means that God has kept his promises. Okay, so not only is God able, right, there's one thing to know that a person can make you promises, there's another thing to know, are they able to fulfill them, right? So sovereignty says God can do anything, and he's accomplished this purpose over the millennia with all kinds of opposition, right, through faulty people just like you and I. But then, all right, is God faithful when he makes promises? Okay, so he's got the power to, to do what he wants, but will he follow through, right? Will he be faithful? Well, Paul's mission means that God has kept his promises. So here, right, Jesus Christ, our Lord, according to the will of God, has set him apart, given him grace, and commissioned him as an apostle to call all the Gentiles to obedience. So God is keeping his promises that he was going to bless all the world through Abraham. Okay? Now, this is God's sense of humor, and even to think about the kinds of things that God in his sovereignty can do to make it happen. He takes Paul, the last person you would ever think would be somebody who would care about Gentiles. Right? And we've mentioned this before. Paul was the uber Jew. Right? And I'm not talking about a driver, uber driver. I'm talking about the super Jew. 
right? I mean, he was the super Jew. I mean, he was the guy, he tells it himself. You can read his testimony. He said, I was so committed to my faith, a version of the faith that rejected Jesus, that I killed people who wanted to follow Jesus. I tried to destroy this new movement. I tried to shut it down, okay? Okay? And what happened? God arrests him on the road to Damascus, turns him 180 degrees around, and not where he just tolerates Gentiles now, but now his whole passion in life is going to be throwing his life at bringing the good news to Gentiles. And so Paul's going to be beaten, he's going to be stoned, he's going to be shipwrecked, he's going to be deprived of comfort and all kinds of things. He's going to be hated by people. All these things are going to happen. Why? Because God has laid on him the, the, the call and created a man in him who yearns for Gentiles to come into the blessings that were promised to Abraham. So God's faithfulness is dramatically demonstrated in Paul's call. Now here, in case we miss it, right, he wants to emphasize at least two times as we look at this about how God is at work among Jews and Gentiles because he's fulfilling the promises he made to the patriarchs, Abraham, right? and so forth and so on. So here in Romans 11, which we'll get there down the road uh, somewhere uh, in the next millennia, we'll get there, but here's Romans 11. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters. Mystery in Paul is something that was formerly hidden but now has been revealed. Now, not mysterious, but something that was hidden and now is revealed. So that you may not be conceited, and he's speaking to Gentiles. Israel... The Jews has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in, right? So God is fulfilling his plan, right? And the Jews' rejection of Jesus is becoming a platform through which God is reaching Gentiles. And in this way, Israel will be saved. And so what he's going to say is there's a future moment coming, and he draws on Old Testament prophecy to illustrate there's a future moment coming where there's going to be a great ingathering of the Jews, where many Jews are going to come to know Christ somewhere in the distant future. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake today. There are Jews who reject Jesus as Messiah. They are enemies of the gospel in the sense that they disagree and see us worshiping really what was a, an, uh, just a side kind of blasphemous rabbi from the past. Okay? So today they're opposed to the gospel and the gospel mission. Okay? But as far as election is concerned, God's choosing of them as unique people, they are loved on account of the patriarchs for God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Just as you were at one time disobedient to God, have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. Okay. Now what Paul is saying here is God is keeping his covenant promises. And we're going to reflect on this. God has made promises to you as his people. Do you believe that he's keeping them? Romans 15, another passage, accept one another. This is his parting advice to the Jews and Gentiles and their tensions with each other. Just as Christ accepted you in order that bring praise to God, for I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews. He's the one through whom the promise that God gave to the Jews to be a blessing to the nations, it was fulfilled in Jesus, the Messiah who came to bring salvation so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed, and moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. God is faithful. You know, and the response of that is, be faithful. Okay? You know, I think about this on the, on the little things of, of every day. Um, We have the constant temptation to try to figure out things and work it on our own. We've got all kinds of advice that comes to us from the world about how to navigate life. And if you want to be faithful to him and you trust him because you believe he is faithful, well, then one of the things that you do is you want to get your day oriented around him. You've got tons of voices screaming at you, so what do you do? You, you pull out his word and you listen to him. 
Say, okay, God, remind me of who I am. Remind me of who you are, of what you're up to. Remind me of what sin looks like. Remind me of things that are fatal for my soul. Remind me of the kind of practices that, that are important for me to sustain my life. God, remind me, right, of even my own weakness, Lord. Humble me, right? So when, you, when you're in this, to be faithful to him is to keep looking to him to let him help you understand who you are and where you are and what you need. That's to be faithful to him, right? And you, you, but once you do that as you're pursuing him, then often the other suitors, the other people that are appealing, you say, no, 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 I trust him. I trust him. I'm going to stick with him. Right? I know I mentioned that it's been rolling around in my head last week. You know, I want to be a person that doesn't prize any situation, any relationship, any job, any applause, any prize. I don't want to pry, I don't want to, I want to, I want to want anything that will make me be embarrassed of Jesus to maintain it or to have it. I want to be faithful to him, right? So be faithful. So we've got a God who's sovereign. Okay, calm down. Things are not out of control. God is faithful, so be faithful today. And then the final one here, a reminder of God's salvation, okay? Now, not only does it talk about, tie us into the biblical storyline and take us forward, but it reminds us of what, ha- what salvation is and what it does, okay? Paul's mission declares that God has opened the way for the Gentiles to come under his rule by faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. So they must turn to Christ in faith, Right? There is no salvation in the other. He is the center of the biblical storyline. How are we going to get into the promises of Abraham that are going to allow us back into the garden, into intimacy with God, and ultimately right into a new heavens and new earth? How is that going to happen? Well, only through Jesus. But faith produces a life of obedience. This is why, as followers of Jesus, when we talk about what it means to be a member here at EBC, one of my callings as a pastor, and your calling as a member, is we're supposed to be discipling one another. And so as, as you're walking, right, and if you, are, 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 you disappear from here and we don't see you, we get concerned because we know that what God tells us to do is to gather with each other. And not just be in the same building, but actually move toward each other. And if I find someone as a pastor who just starts to disappear or kind of retire from, from relationships with people or just go out, right, out of the church altogether, I know something bad is going on. Because that's not how a healthy Christian behaves. And when I go after them, it's not to beat them and say, you need to be here when the church doors are open. No, I miss you as my brother and sister, and I'm concerned about where you're going. Because I'm invested in them. And so everywhere in Scripture, a a, a new life with Jesus will create new desires in you. It'll create new habits in you. It'll create certain things now that you used to find attractive, but now they're not so attractive anymore. Matter of fact, you run from them. It just creates a different person. Now, can you put somebody on a growth chart and say, where are you, year two? Well, you should be 10 degrees holy. No, you can't put anybody on a growth chart. But it will change you over time, and it's unique to your own circumstances and background. Some of you come in with with abuse in your past that God wants to heal. Some of you come in with great homes behind you, but you've learned to live off of the faith of your parents, and now you have to make Jesus your king. So as you grow up, God's going to challenge you in different ways. Right, in terms of, uh, of as you come. But this is the kind of life that he takes us to. So when we come, right, to celebrate the communion, okay, when we come to celebrate the communion, one of the practices that we always do is self-examination because Paul encourages that. Why is that? Because we're on the way people and we want to look at what Jesus did about who Jesus is, about what he called us to do, and we want to listen to him and give his spirit time to work in our souls to see if we've forgotten who we are, to see if we've forgotten who he is, to see if we've forgotten the direction that we should be going, to see if we've become unfaithful. It's always meant to recalibrate our Christian life as we come together. So, the obedience that springs from a wholehearted trust in Jesus 
is what Paul calls us to. It reminds us, right, as we come here to our, I think here, whoops, oh, there, next one, you, you just had it right there, right, whoops, it's not, it doesn't want to, it's just peeking at us, right? You got to remember really quickly, remember quickly. Uh, so for some reason it's stuck on there, but it takes us back to the ideas. As we come, I really want, you know, as I understand scripture and what, what is done else, uh, elsewhere, you cannot merely remember things the way God intends them just by thinking about them. You need to pray and ask God to take those truths that you know and help you to live in them. Okay? I, I, this is so important. This is one of those things that just uh, is so crazy is that we know, right, especially if you grew up in the church, you know lots of truth, but your life is not conformed to half of what you know. You need to live into the truth that God's in control. You need to live into the truth that he can be trusted. And you need to live into the truth that when you're saved, it changes you and leads to obedience. All right? All right, as we turn to communion, I just want to invite you at this moment, as we come to this time of remembrance, I want to invite you to take a couple moments. And if you need a prompt, right, one of the things that's going to happen, if you're like me, if you, don't have, if you don't set your mind on something, your mind will wander to whatever's happening after church today or the person that's annoying you right around you. So I, I want to encourage you, take a prayer of David, bow your head and say, Lord, search me, try me, see if there's anything in me that's setting some barrier between you and I. God, do that. Give a moment, let the Spirit of God work, and as he brings things to your mind, confess them, repent of them, say, Lord, I see that. God, forgive me of that and accept his forgiveness and move on. Do this as a moment to let the Spirit of God do some housekeeping in your soul. Okay? So I have a moment of quiet for us just to pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy to us today. Uh, Lord, every day is a day of mercy. You extend to us, uh, Lord, your compassion in our frailty, in our failures, and sometimes in the face of our outright rebellion against what we know you have called us to do and to be. Lord, please, would you be so kind as to, by your Spirit, to reveal those things in us that have set our hearts against you, have uh, lifted up our own pride uh, to get us to trust ourselves or some other voice. Uh, please be merciful to us as your people. Thank you, Lord, that you have committed yourself to us, Lord, forever, that you have rescued us completely, you have brought us to yourself, and you have promised to bring uh, us to the goal for which you have saved us. And Lord, we know we can trust you because you have always been faithful. You've always kept your promises. And so Lord, help us to trust you that you're big enough, you're, you're sovereign, you're powerful enough, you're faithful enough. Lord, that we need to look to you and trust you, Lord, for everything in life. So Lord, as we come to this moment to reflect on the death of Jesus, on everything that he's done, Lord, please, would you help us remember in a way that, that draws us close to you, draws us away from sin. 
Lord, impels us forward on obedience, Lord, and serving you in every way. Uh, so, Lord, we pray this in the name of Jesus.